Date on Sundays, I'm going to go through this very quickly because Tristan uh, did a very good job of this yesterday. But I just wanted to point out that un uncertainty in the, in the data comes in many forms and has many different sources. Of course, we start with the point level observation. And a lot of modeling goes into identifying or, or quantifying the uncertainty for every individual point. And uh, Tristan illustrated some of that yesterday. But moving on from there, we then start taking this point cloud and doing stuff with it. Um, typically, the kind of stuff we do first is filtering the data. So that could be ground classification, it could be uh, extracting building heights or canopy cover. And so we apply filtering algorithms to the data. Well, there's a lot of um, subjectivity in the parameters that you use in your algorithms or what type of algorithm or how that algorithm is uh, implemented. And so at that stage, uncertainty is introduced into your model. Um, there is also uh, uncertainty associated with the uh, uh, angle of incidence on the terrain, uh, overlap density between flight lines. Um, if we're constructing models, let's say canopy biometrics, then uh, there'll be um, uncertainties associated with the, the model construction itself. For example, how do we, you take a percentile distribution of that point cloud and turn that into an attribute, say, the, a biomass attribute or a carbon attribute or some habitat related or other classification attribute. So the model itself introduces uncertainty. And then if we, let's say we're doing calibration, let's just say we're doing straightforward calibration with field data, well then of course there's the bias or the uncertainty introduced from our field data into that model. So what that means is, <coughs> at every one of these steps, we're propagating a little bit of uncertainty on our way to our final product that we want to derive, whatever that product may be. It could be a watershed product, it could be a biomass product. But at every one of those steps, some uncertainty is propagated. And so uh, you need to have a bit of a handle on those uncertainties to uh, basically um, understand whether or not you should trust the product. Anyway, very often if the uncertainties are very small and you know, relative to the variance that we'll see, um, but nonetheless, it is something that should be borne in mind. So I don't want to dwell on this too much, but just one illustration of how the survey configuration uh, can alter the uh, accuracy of the point cloud at ground level in a, for an unambiguous surface like a parking lot or a runway or some kind of um, control surface. So what we see here is uh, we've got a control survey configuration. It doesn't really matter what that is, it's just a control. But then what we've done is we've widened the beam, which essentially widens the footprint of the laser pulse um, for configuration two. Configuration three, all else is equal, we're just flying higher. Configuration four, all else is equal, we're just flying higher density. We've increased our repetition frequency from, say, 33,000 measurements a second to 100,000 measurements a second. Uh, so we're testing these three uh, different configurations. And so what we see is, uh, just looking at the averages, um, not a lot of change for wide beam, um, but high altitude, high PRF uh, increases our um, offset a little bit. But what's, what we really should look at is the standard deviations and the RMSE. So the standard deviation is an index of the noise, and the RMSE is an index of the noise plus any bias. And so what we see is that the, the errors, as they would typically be quantified, seem to systematically increase from our control um, up towards high PRF. Now that's interesting because high PRF, you would think, well, we've got high data density, isn't that a good thing? Well, maybe it is. In many situations, you want higher density, and you'll accept a little bit of increased uncertainty for the higher information content that that data density gives you. Um, but with that higher data density, there is one trade-off. Every emitted pulse has a lower energy associated with it. With that lower energy um, becomes more, uh, more uh, ambiguity um, in the thresholding that's used to determine the time at which uh, the reflection or the target was actually uh, encountered. So there's a little bit of temporal uh, uncertainty increase. Uh, sorry, the, <coughs> the temporal uncertainty in the in the timestamp increases um, when you use lower energy uh, laser pulses. Uh, it's probably not a big deal in most applications, but as you can see here, we've gone from a five centimeter RMSE to a 14 centimeter RMSE over exactly the same area. So for some applications, that may be of some significance. 
Um, these are just illustrating that all of the uh, returns in a discrete system are calibrated against the signal strength, the intensity. And so here we have a, a calibration table. So here we have um, an index of intensity. It's really an arbitrary uh, set of units, but uh, the, here we have low intensity values, here we have high intensity, or these would be dark, these would be bright signal responses. And then here we have a, a range offset associated with those signal intensities. So uh, we have negative offsets for low intensities, positive offsets for high intensities, and you can see we range from on the order of 15 centimeters uh, up to about 20 centimeters. So the point to get out of that is if this, you don't have this calibration, this intensity calibration um, accurately defined, then you can introduce uh, decimeters of error, systematic error, just associated with the signal intensity response and the, and the kind of internal calibration. If you're interested in tra change detection, <coughs> and in this, this particular example, the change we're interested in is looking at canopy growth. Um, I, I put this in because we were talking about monitoring yesterday. Monitoring is something that's come up time and time again and is coming up more and more and more in the LiDAR community. So it's important to get a handle on, well, okay, we're, we're starting to understand the uncertainties for a single data set, one snapshot in time, but what does that mean if we're comparing attributes through time? So in this example, what we're looking at is canopy growth. So um, uh, what we can see here is the, the error or the standard deviation associated with our measurement of growth, and we have that here, um, relative to total growth over that same, same time increment. So what we see is that for one year, the amount of error observed is, oh, I've got to get the axes right, it's... Um, the amount of error observed is probably on the order of 30 centimeters or, uh, or well, no, okay, this, the total growth is about half a meter. The amount of error observed is about 30 centimeters. So, uh, you know, they're pretty close. Uh, so that means after one year, you're probably not going to be highly confident in your growth because the total growth and the error is of, is of the same order. But of course, as total growth increases, the, the difference you're measuring increases uh, and uh, the uncertainty actually drops. So essentially, by the time you hit three years in this particular example, we're down to a 10% uncertainty. So from a monitoring point of view, in this particular context, you probably want to wait about three years before you've got high confidence that the change you're observing reflects reality.